who's looking at developments in LIDAR and mensuration, including an um, exercise he was involved in, um, uh, which has got a European dimension to it. And also from Kenny Cotland, who is known to a lot of us as well um, with his work on um, species in uh, Forster Land Scotland and wider than that. Uh, both very good talks, which um, I'm sure you will enjoy. Following which we, as Jamie said, will take question and answer. And then there'll be two short presentations, one from Andy Leach about the Industrial Liaison Group. And you've seen the, um, uh, the slides for that. And finally, from Jamie to update on industry matters. So without any further ado, I will introduce Ian Stewart from James Jones and Sons and ask him to, uh, to take the floor. Ian. Thanks very much, Will. Um, I kind of got landed with this by a colleague and when asked what I would speak on, he offered that I would speak on drones or forest mensuration or LIDAR and somehow these all got conflated into the one issue and I, I have no intention of speaking about drones, LIDAR and forest mensuration all in the one package. If I could start off, I will try to share my screen. And I hope you can all see this. That's fine, uh, Ian. Thank you, Jamie. Um, back in 2016, I was involved in a European research project uh, called EFORTE. Now, the, the academic partners in this were LUCA, who are the equivalent of forest research in Finland, Skogforce, who are the equivalent in Sweden, and FCBA, who are the equivalent of forest research in France. We also had a good number of industry partners, mostly from Scandinavia and France. And this project was looking at, or my part in it was looking at reducing soil damage due to forest operations. During this project, I was introduced to a Swedish system using LIDAR to predict the optimum extraction routes that is the, the shortest distance to carry the timber to roadside and cause the least soil damage in doing that. And this looked very much like something we could use in this country. However, it does rely on LIDAR. And as I'm sure you're all aware in this country, we use contours to depict terrain on our maps. And we did try using very closely spaced contours, but it just wasn't good enough to, for, for the system to operate. And it, it does require LIDAR for it to work. Now, for those of you who perhaps haven't seen LIDAR, um, you're aware of contour maps. We have aerial photographs, which will show us what the site looks like at the moment. But a LIDAR image, we can have two different kinds of LIDAR images. There's the digital surface model, and that captures all the surfaces of the vegetation, the built environment. So you've got all the trees, the vegetation, houses, bridges, and so forth. And then we can also produce a digital terrain model, which bears down onto the ground surface and removes all the vegetation, all the built elements, and just shows the surface layer. Now, this is what's used in the Swedish system, is the terrain model. And the good thing about a terrain model is that even supposing it was captured several years ago, the terrain doesn't change unless you dig a great big quarry or something. The surface model will change as the trees and the vegetation grows, but the terrain model doesn't. So we can still use it for many years after the information was gathered. Now in Sweden, almost 100% of the country is covered by LIDAR imaging, and that is open to everyone to use. However, it is a somewhat different picture in this country. The Scottish Government have this remote sensing portal where we can access the LiDAR imagery which is currently available. But at the time of the project, 
these were the only areas which had LiDAR that was available. And these were gathered for use by SEPA. So as you can see, they cover um, river basins and really were of very limited use to foresters. However, um, the Scottish Government had set aside money to carry out a large scale LIDAR gathering operation in South Scotland in 2018. However, due to various problems, that never actually happened. But the Scottish Energy Power Networks had already flown these areas and gathered information between 2015 and 2017. And the Scottish Government used the funds which they had set aside to purchase this data. And this was then made available to the public early on in 2019. Now, just by way of a comparison, this is the level of LIDAR coverage in England and Wales. So, mid-2019, uh, this was a site which James Jones owned down near Langham. And I discovered that at this point, we now had LIDAR coverage of this area, which was about to be felled. Now, as you can see from the aerial picture, it's an unthinned crop. There's a couple of areas of wind blow, but beyond that, you can't see much more. However, the LIDAR imagery shows us more detail on the surface. You can see the ditches through this area here and through here. You can quite clearly see the uh, ploughing. And towards the eastern side, you can see how the ground rises. So I took this information along with the volume measurements and sent them to a colleague in Sweden. And he constructed for me what was known as a depth to water map. Now this uses the topography to predict how close the water table lies to the surface. The closer the water table is to the surface, the darker the blue colour, and the more likely we are to cause soil damage if we enter into that area. Now this first image was produced using Swedish conditions. And in Sweden, they have far less rainfall than we do in Scotland. So I asked them to predict something with a much more rainfall. And this was the result. They cobbled something together sort of halfway between the two of these. And this depth to water map, along with the terrain information and the timber volume information, was assembled into a system called Timber Trail. Now, I'm aware this is a little difficult to see, but bear with me, there are better pictures later. The information is all collated within this system and it comes up with the optimal extraction routes so that the timber is carried the shortest distance and we do the least amount of damage. In this particular instance, I don't know if you can see, but the extraction route is shown as going outside the harvesting area, which is not always the best thing. So within the system, you can specify where exactly you wish the timber to be put to roadside. You can put in crossing points, which you will construct across the wet ground. You can put in areas which you wish to avoid. You don't wish the forwarder to cross the road, so you put in a no-go area down the road, or you may have a badger set or something of that nature that you want to avoid. 
that that then recalculates the extraction routes. And this hopefully will allow you to see in more detail. These red routes are the main extraction routes, which will carry in excess of 400 cubic metres of timber. The system then also will show secondary extraction routes, which will carry up to 100 cubic metres of timber. And then the minor routes, these will carry 10 cubic metres of timber. So effectively, these are individual forwarder journeys. This information can be put into a GPS system within the forwarder and harvester, and the drivers are able to follow this rather like a sat nav in a car. And it means that even in bad weather, bad light conditions, they can still see where they should be going without ever having to leave the cab of the vehicle. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have the experience or the expertise to use this kind of technology. Many of the machines have these systems on board, but people haven't been using them and are not comfortable to use them as yet. So the best I could do was to produce a paper map showing the routes I wanted the forwarder operator to use to avoid the wet ground. And this was provided at the pre-commencement meeting in February 2020. So we all know what happened next. The job did continue, but I wasn't able to travel and I wasn't able to oversee the operations as they went forward. And I wasn't able to get back to the site until all the harvesting had been completed sometime later. So I was able to gather some drone footage once the site was finished. This is taken from the north and I have inverted the maps to make it a little more obvious. The area down the roadside, which was shown as to be very wet, corresponded with a roadside ditch. So we were able to cart timber to that roadside. But this timber on the western side was taken away from the road, down to the south, and then out to the roadside along the southern edge, avoiding this area here, which was very wet. And we successfully avoided doing too much damage there. On the eastern side, you can see the timber was carried to the roadside here. And this area was taken across and down through the central part of the site, as was suggested by the system. However, this area did not stand up as well as we had hoped and we did cause some rutting on that area. This is another image taken from the eastern side. And again, you can see this central area didn't stand up as well as we had hoped. This area to the north we always knew was going to be wet because it was windblown. So, not a hugely successful trial, but it's something I intend to try again. Hopefully, uh, uh, we will be able to monitor it more closely this time. And we hope to be able to use the LIDAR more effectively in the extraction of timber from sites in the future. However, at this stage, it will only be possible in South Scotland as the LIDAR coverage in the north is simply not good enough at the moment. So that's all I want to say on that subject. If I can now jump forward into timber measurement, um, it's a subject, as some of you may know, which is very close to my heart. And 
It's a subject which I feel is very sadly neglected by far too many of our industry today. Far too many seals land on my desk with the bold statement of the volume has been estimated by the woodland manager or the crop summary figures are estimates and provided for guidance only. Or no mensuration has been carried out. The figures given are best estimates at the time of sale. Or even the sale volume has been reached through a visual estimation of the crop. And yet, on the basis of that kind of information, we're asked to give details of expected breakout, a single through and through price, and often a guaranteed minimum value. How then can any agent offer any useful advice to a client on what is it the best offer if he doesn't himself know what there was there to start with? The largest guaranteed minimum price does not respect, reflect the best value to the client if a higher tonnage price is offered, but they don't know how much volume is there. At a time when timber prices are at levels never previously seen, it's more important than ever that we understand our crops. So this is the kind of kit I started with 40 years ago. I still carry a tape in my jacket everywhere I go. The hypsometer's still in the car for when the batteries run out on the other one. And it's never a bad idea to carry a notebook. I'm sure there'll be some of you watching who remember using the tally system, being the booker, and working out your volume at the end of the day. However, we have moved forward, and this is the kind of kit I've been using for the last 20 years. As a small industry, no one seems to have found it economic to produce software that will take the data from this kind of equipment and produce volume information. The last industry-wide system that I'm aware of was CDAP, which was produced for the Forestry Commission back in 2006. But that only operates on Windows XP. And since that's no longer supported by Microsoft, it's kind of fallen into abeyance. The result is that people carrying out this kind of work tend to develop their own systems, as I have myself. My system's not exactly what you would call user friendly. It works for me, I wrote it, I know it's vagaries, but it's not robust enough for me to pass it on to others to use. Within our company, we've now got several sets of measuring equipment and quite a number of people trained to use it. But all, all of the data is ending up coming back to me to be processed. And as I'm now quickly approaching 60, with retirement coming more and more visible in the distance, I suggested to the directors that it was time that we developed something more robust, which could be used by everyone who was carrying out measurement work. As a result, we've started a conversation with Stephen Bartlett and a company called Mindworks, and they've developed something for us which I'm now extremely happy with. These are screenshots, so you won't get the full benefit of this, but it will let you see how the system works. <clears throat> it is a cloud-based system, so you do need an internet connection for it to work. But you download your caliper files into your computer, and then you upload them at this point. You can also include a map file, and you can include a shape file, which can be used further down the line in the My Safety app. This app is used for monitoring um, harvesting sites, but I, I won't go into that aspect of it. I'll simply stick to the measurement side of things. So once you've input your data, 
Oh, I beg your pardon, I've gone the wrong way. This comes up. It shows you the number of groups which are included in your caliper data and asks you if the data is for a thinned or an unthinned stand. And you have to put in the gross area for each group. You can then have a factor reducing from gross to net area. And that can be different for each group. And that will automatically set your net area. The plot sizes are lifted directly from the caliper data. So once you then proceed, you will come to this screen where your volume assortment report is shown. The map will be attached. And in these boxes here, you have one that says view, another which says add notes. If you click on view, it will bring up the data for each individual group. You have, as I said, these are screenshots, but on the actual app, this is scrollable and you can move up and down and see all the information. This, will, this system will also cope with mixed species in a plot. In this case, it was Japanese larch and Sitka spruce, and I think you will see that some of the plots returned a null value. There was no larch in them. However, the system will cope with that and still give an accurate average over the entire area. The notes button will bring up a box which will allow you to add notes for each group. There is one further button here for adding a group. Now I'm sure we've all seen this, uh, the instance where we have perhaps three groups, 10 hectares, five hectares, two hectares, and then there's a little clump at the roadside of quarter of a hectare of great big sick that don't fit into anything else. So this allows you to add a group for these little outliers or blocks of wind blow or something of that nature. You put in the number of trees, the average volume, the total volume, and the DBH, and by clicking on the button here, it automatically populates the assortment field. And then when you save group, it will add it to the assortment report. And you can then add a notes page to that. Once you have all your data here, you click on create and issue the report. This then sends an email to the harvesting manager that this is to be received by, so he knows he has a new report waiting. And when he goes into the system, he will have a job list. The green ones are those waiting to be viewed. The white ones are those which have already been viewed. And when he clicks on view report, he will receive a spreadsheet with the full assortment details, the map, and all the notes so that he can then use that to go forward and carry out any valuation you might want to do on the site. So if anyone's sitting with a set of massive calipers in a cupboard somewhere which they haven't used because they don't have a system to process the data, can I suggest you contact Stephen Bartlett at Mindworks, who I'm sure will be happy to assist you in making use of these in the future. So that was as much as I was going to say. Thank you, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. I think that was an excellent presentation, Ian. You covered a lot of ground there. I think you've stunned the audience into silence as well. Um, I'm not seeing anything coming up in the chat at all. Excellent, let's move on. <laughs> we'll not let you out of it that quickly. We'll give you a chance later on to uh, to come back. But if there are no questions for you, um, we'll uh, move on to uh, to Kenny Cortland and uh, ask Kenny to come in and speak a bit about the uh, forest operations from our wildlife interest point of view. 
Okay, doke. Uh, I shall try and share my screen now and see how we get on. Uh, can you see that at all? Yeah, yep. we can see that. Uh, uh, that's in uh, not in presentation mode yet, uh, Kenny. You want to? Um... Yeah. Okay. How's that? Is that it? That's great, thank you. OK, well, thank you very much for inviting me along uh, this evening. Jamie asked me to talk about wildlife constraints and forest operations, so I gave that some thought today. I've probably got too many slides, so I shall uh, whiz through this. OK, so I went and looked again at the list of protected species on the, SA, uh, the Nature Scott website and picked out the ones that were relevant to FLS and anyway, forestry in general, but these are the ones that we have to deal with routinely. So the yellow ones are ones that come up, you know, quite frequently, and the red ones are the species that come up all the time, you know, weekly or monthly, like goshawk, kites, badgers, and squirrels. So there's quite a lot of species there that we have to contend with, that we have to reconcile with timber production, and it's the same for all you guys, of course. And then uh, that previous slide was the specially protected species, and there are some other species that aren't specially protected. They're not on the schedules of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, for example, uh, these birds listed here, but they are, they do have basic protection, so you can't destroy a nest while it's in use, for example. So buzzard and black grouse are two species that come up very frequently uh, in, in our work, and we have to mitigate for those. And then there are a few other birds that come up frequently, uh, but not as often. And then below that, I've got some birds there, long-eared owl, passerines, that's all your wee perching birds like chaffinches, etc., and tawny owl. Now, these hardly come up in our work, which means uh, when we do pre-operational checks, we are not finding them. And um, that is potentially a problem, and some members of the public frequently complain that we're felling during the breeding season. And there's no doubt they were felling quite a number of nests of birds like siskins and chaffinches. So that's something that we've not really got to grips with. And there's a bit of exposure there for the forestry sector, I think. Similarly, Kenny, Kenny sorry to interrupt you. Do you uh, we, uh, I was wrong. You, you just after I said that it was fine. You, in fact, you need to switch back into a, a full presentation mode, please. Um, OK. We're, we're seeing your. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. So you were seeing my notes. That's fine. OK, so uh, getting back on track. So uh, the bottom half of that list, as I said, was these birds that we're not really uh, coping with very well. And then some um, species of amphibian and reptile that are uh, protected. They're listed on Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countries Act. They have special protection. But we seldom mitigate for those, and common lizards, for example, are found throughout most forests that we all deal with. So there are some issues there in terms of some species that we're not adequately protecting, I guess. So if we move on and take a selection of these species down the left there, some of them are highly protected like bats, some have just got basic protection like grey heron, but these are species that we have to deal with frequently. And if we look at the graph there that shows the breeding seasons, you can see that throughout the year, you know, there's some sort of uh, environmental constraint that's going to come up for most operations. So certainly on FLS ground, just about every planned felling operation has an associated wildlife constraint this year. And the cost of the forestry sector of all this mitigation is clearly very significant. I've done some fag packet calculations that suggest it's in millions. So it's not a trivial issue. So some pe people have questioned whether the cost of all this mitigation and the cost of these uh, the protection is justified. And it's an interesting question, I guess, because if you think of some of the species that occur in plantations, such as capercaillie, they they absolutely depend on the habitat that's created by the forestry sector. Similarly for Scottish crossbills, they're absolutely dependent upon 
plantations. They use them um, very frequently indeed. The same goes for the other two species of crossbills. Great spotted woodpeckers are increasing rapidly as we increase the amount of deadwood. So these both these species do very well in plantations. Goshawks are spreading really rapidly and the, the main habitat that they're using are plantations. They like nesting in pine, uh, larch, even sitka. We all know the story of the pine mart and it's spreading back across the country and uh, largely facilitated uh, by plantation habitats. And this sort of landscape is familiar to us all and it's often derided by various conservation minded people, which um, the longer I'm in forestry and studying these places, the more uh, bizarre I find that criticism because, for example, these places are absolutely stuffed full of field walls, which support a really interesting community of predators. And we are actually doing some work on that, uh, this sort of community at the moment in the Cairngorms Connect area. And these voles also protect um, the wildcat, one of the rarest, um, one of the rarest species in Scotland. And uh, these plantations in Aberdeenshire and down in Angus are the last uh, refuge for these species. So the point of all these examples is that you know there's a lot of evidence indicating that landscapes managed for timber production provide good to really high quality habitats for a range of protected and priority species, including many of the ones like this one that the public are really interested in. Um, and that's great, given that the country is going to need timber forevermore and the amount of plantations is going to increase. So it's a really good news story there uh, that we haven't really conveyed very effectively to the public. So the main points of this first wee bit are that, um, you know, there's about 32 species that we all have to consider regularly or very regularly in terms of mitigation during forest stops. And this is very expensive, but as we've just seen, these plantations are very crucial habitats for many species. And, you know, the research that's been done to date, and I'll give an example shortly, indicates that the collateral damage to a few individuals from forestry operations. So, you know, there's no doubt that a few um, baby birds and some young squirrels and maybe some young bats, etc., are killed by forestry operations, but it's generally trivial in the context of the benefit to these species that plantations and productive forests provide. So, this, these legal aspects are not really uh, conservation issues. It's it's a legal issue, and it's interesting because, as I understand it, most of these laws were enacted for. Uh, reasons not related to forestry, for example, to protect birds from uh, hunters and egg collectors and badgers from badger baiters, etc. And some people describe it as, you know, forestry is being somewhat unfairly penalised um, because we're providing all this habitat, yet we're having to carry out all this mitigation that some people think is a bit over the top. Anyway, the situation is unlikely to change on any time scale that's relevant to us. It's very seldom that birds or other protected species come off these schedules. So it's, the situation is unlikely to change anytime soon. So we need to improve our understanding of the impact of forestry activities on protected species. So I'll give you an example of what FLS has been doing with uh, partners in relation to one particular species. And that species is the red squirrel which is, has been described as a, a tree rat with good PR. It's exceedingly popular, but closely related to the rat. So it's an interesting difference in opinion in the public about these two species. So squirrels thrive in plantations. In fact, there's absolutely no doubt that the squirrel, red squirrel population in Scotland would not be viable were it not for the existence of plantations. So that's an interesting thing to bear in mind. And, and they're listed on Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but it is an offence to uh, damage, destroy or obstruct access to a dray, basically. And one of the problems is that finding drays is difficult and then ascertaining whether the drays in use or not is even more difficult, if not impossible. 
So when we got to grips with this issue, it became apparent that there was hardly any research had been done on this topic. So as with much of the guidance that's available, it's based on not very much and people's best guess about what mitigation is required and effective. So uh, we undertook with um, Louise de Rad at the University of the Highlands and Islands with some funding from the Cairngorms Park to do some research into this topic. I'm not going into the details too much, but essentially we radio, radio tagged uh, a lot of squirrels. And here's one doing his bit for the forestry sector. He's just had his tag fitted and not looking too happy, but he was doing his bit for the species. So we tagged a number of squirrels and we followed them before, during and after a forestry operation to try and find out what impact these operations actually have on red squirrels. And the operation in question in the first iteration was a, a thinning operation in a pine wood near Fairness. Because we had no idea what happens you know, to squirrels during a, such an operation. We didn't know that if whether or not they just completely left the area as soon as the harvester turned on its engine. So our, our information and knowledge was really lacking. So Using the collars that we fitted also had a GPS element, which was slightly unreliable, but when they worked, the data that you get back is absolutely astounding. So here's the study site, and here are some data points from the GPS unit for one of the squirrels. And the amount of data you get when these things work is quite incredible. Um, the trouble is they don't oft, sometimes they don't work very well in trees, but you can see we've got still got hundreds and hundreds of points. We we're also radio tracking the animals at the same time, which is very labor intensive, but it uh, was more reliable. So here's the sort of data we got in this forest. You can see these are the home ranges of females in this case, and you can see the key there. We've got um, um, dray sites, I think it is in this case. Yeah, these are dray sites before, during and after operations. And so the first thing we learned that during the operations, the squirrels essentially stay in the, stay in the forest. They make minor alterations to their ranging when the machines are nearby, but otherwise they are largely uh, unaffected. And, you know, this was quite revelatory. Unbelievably, there was nothing in the scientific literature about this at all. So this was new stuff. And Louise and her team did a really great job of obtaining this info. So the summary of what she's found to date, there have been several iterations of this, this research and currently Louise and her team are looking at the impact of a clear fell on squirrels with the help of several of the estates that are represented here tonight, for which we're very grateful. So as I've said so far, the thinning operations had a you know, minimal effect on their ranging behaviour and dray use, didn't have a negative effect on population density, there's no evidence of an impact, a negative impact on breeding success. Um, and the squirrels are capable of dispersing across open ground, although we know from other research they are vulnerable to predation when they do that, but they can do it no problem. And um, the ones that have been tagged on sites that have been clear filled, uh, we did a small site last year, they left the clear fell site in established home ranges in adjacent woodland. So it would seem that uh, the standard sort of for forestry operations that we're all involved in uh, don't trouble squirrels too much. Obviously, the landscape, the forestry plantation landscape is changing constantly. It's a shifting mosaic, a suitable habitat, and the carrying capacity for squirrels varies locally through time. And that's something we have to explain quite often to members of the public who phone in to complain that their local wood has been failed. But uh, it's completely fair to explain to them that the carrying capacity varies in space and time, but roughly stays the same. And in fact, will increase as the woodland cover in Scotland increases. So in a way you could say that, I mean, naturally squirrels move about in forest landscapes, natural forest landscapes to follow the cone crops of different tree species because they don't all cone as well in a synchronous way. So you could say that, <coughs> excuse me, that squirrels are almost pre-adapted to live in productive forestry landscape. And that's maybe a line that 
we should take a bit more often. So red squirrels and forest operations at an individual squirrel level is not really problematic and they can deal with it no bother it would seem. Another interesting aspect that we've not got to grips with though is that um, you know squirrels are protected from damage to their drays but they routinely move their young around in fact the bottom right hand picture there is a taken in my garden a, a female squirrel moving one of our large young about and they move them between uh, drays to probably alleviate the uh, problems with ticks and drays that build up. So they, they move them around routinely and I've got a fair few anecdotal observations of squirrels doing this uh, in relation to clear felling operations. So just because a clear felling operation is ongoing doesn't mean that all the young squirrels in the drays that are going to be felled inevitably um, are going to be killed because squirrels habitually move their young about anyway in response to various uh, issues. We haven't quite got to grips with this apart from these anecdotal observations, but it's something to bear in mind that the mortality of young squirrels is probably a lot less than the worst case scenario we sort of assume. Okay, so the next thing we did was to look at uh, population modeling of squirrels. So instead of looking at the individual level, looking at the population level and how the populations coped with uh, forestry and failing operations. And this was with Andy White and Andrew Slade, Harriet Watt and Peter Lurs. Now, these models are based on calculus. So you remember at school when folk used to say, what's the hell's the point of doing calculus? It's never any use to anybody. Well, it turns out it is quite useful. And Andy and Peter have built this really good population model for squirrels that incorporates birth rates and death rates and immigration and emigration. Uh, disease, predation, and it's spatially explicit, so you can really model a real life scenario. And this is one of the this is the the model that's used to um, plan conservation action for squirrels, you know, in Scotland and Nature Scott use it. So I'm not going into too much details of this, mainly because my calculus is a bit rough and, and ready. But basically, they modelled. Uh, scenarios whereby um, the squirrels were living in landscape and there was a, a sort of average amount of harvesting uh, going on in space and time and looking at how that affected uh, the population as a whole. So the first part uh, focused on red squirrel strongholds. So you'll hopefully be familiar that with these, that Forest Commission designated these strongholds some time ago. I should say Colin Edwards, who's in the audience, was involved in this work. And what we did was we compared stronghold management. So if you go online, you'll find recommendations for management for squirrels in these strongholds, which are which involve a lot of red squirrel specific work um, based on best knowledge available at the time. So we compared this idealized type of management for red squirrels and strongholds with standard UKFS type management. Uh, just I guess we call it normal forestry practice these days uh, and on a sort of represent representative scale in space and time. And they did an assessment of six of these strongholds. And then the second part of the work was to forget about the strongholds that had been designated already. They modelled the population of red squirrels uh, in Scotland as a whole to try and identify regions of forest uh, that would be capable of maintaining red squirrels under normal forestry management, uh, just the sort of stuff that you guys are doing every day of the week. <coughs> Excuse me. And they modelled that both with and without um, grey squirrel control. And the aim was to identify natural strongholds in the landscape of Scotland where forests could uh, maintain red squirrels, even under the worst case scenario where grey squirrels have colonised the whole of Scotland. So quick summary is that in the absence of grey squirrels, typical UKFS based management is sufficient to maintain viable 
spread squirrel population. So that's really interesting. It's, it's the sort of thing, it's the thing that we all kind of knew because we see squirrels all the time in these plantations. But this was it confirmed objectively and mathematically. <clears throat> and red squirrel specific management is not really necessary if there are no grey squirrels about. Red squirrels do fine in the habitat that is created by growing timber for uh, creating a product. And even in the worst case scenario where grey squirrels expand to all regions of Scotland, the model identified areas where red squirrels will still persist, uh, even without uh, grey squirrel control, which was sort of reassuring. And uh, ironically, uh, given that most people imagine red squirrels running about granny pine trees, the places that will probably act as refuges for red squirrels in that scenario are, I guess you might call them hard nose plantations comprising mainly conifers. And the reason for that is that red squirrels can outcompete uh, grey squirrels in this sort of habitat. So there are several areas in Scotland where um, the reds could persist even if greys were everywhere else. So that was quite interesting and again showed the benefit of um, plantation habitats for a very popular species. So what's the relevance of that to um, the constraints we're discussing tonight. Well, on the basis of this sort of research, FLS was able to apply to Nature Scott for a license to manage red squirrels. So based on the guidance note 33, I think it is, on red squirrels, which was written with the best available knowledge at the time I was involved in writing them, um, there were some grey areas in that and FLS, I don't know, and probably some of the private sector, we kind of fudged it and almost ignored the red squ squirrel issue and didn't tackle it explicitly and properly, I guess. And we all kind of knew that we were committing some collateral damage to squirrels, but that was never quantified and we were all uh, very vague as to what was actually happening. So this squirrel license that we agreed with Nature Scott uh, allows us to carry out work you know, openly admitting that there will be some disturbance and to squirrels and maybe some damage and destruction of drays and maybe a few young animals might be killed. We explicitly acknowledge that. So it's sort of all out in the open. If we get an FOI, we can say, yeah, we understand this. And the aim is to quantify the impact. So the license, which I can share, subsequently uh, to this evening's talk and uh, it's basically revolves around this flow chart here and you can see that that explicitly allows us to do thinning and clear felling during the breeding se squirrel breeding season um, uh, although we have to in enact various mitigation although the mitigation that we've agreed in these mitigation packs is not too onerous it's very reasonable but of course we can't just willy-nilly do thinning and felling operations in squirrel habitat. There has to be a purpose because licenses can only be um, legal if there's a legally identified purpose. And this list here shows you the list of legally supported purposes that we've worked to. So essentially our license enables us at the level of an individual operation to assess the impact uh, on squirrels of any particular operation against the management pressure. So you see at the bottom of the list there, it includes cost. So if delaying an operation is going to cost, um, you know, tens of thousands of pounds and the operation is only going to affect a very few squirrels, on that basis, you know, we record our decision ma making process because we're always subject to FOI and we will undoubtedly be FOI on this. So we now uh, openly and explicitly record our decision making process. And in most cases, it's pretty straightforward because most operations <coughs> impinge upon only a small number of the, a small proportion of the squirrels in any forest block. And we estimate the number of squirrels, not by direct counts, because that's very, very difficult. We estimate it based on multiplying the area by average densities that are published in the scientific literature. So we're making estimates of the population. We then assess that number against these management pressures and we can make an objective decision. So the license works 
uh, really well. And Nature Scott have been fairly pragmatic about it. It's brought the whole squirrel management thing out into the open. We're quantifying it. It's all um, there for the, the public to see. It's saving us money. It's reducing constraints and it's not affecting the squirrel population in a significant way. And I can say that because we've quantified it. So here I've got the license summary for the first two years. I haven't got round to quantifying it for the last year and a half. But this gives you some figures about the um, number of times or the area over which we used the license. So we, we made in these two years 190 assessments. You know, that's judging the management pressure against the impact on squirrels at the site level. And we proceeded with the forest operations, whereas previously a large number of these would have been deferred to another time of year when machines would have been running in in wet conditions and disturbing the soil and potentially polluting rivers. So we tallied up the number of squirrels that were affected by FLS and you can see that less than 1% of the red squirrel population was displaced uh, into adjacent areas by clear felling um, and a very small proportion of the squirrels in any season, in any year, were affected. So LMP is Land Management Plan, it's the new name for Forest Design Plan. So very small proportions of the squirrels in these land management plans were affected by squirrels. So I think now we've we've got a pragmatic way of working. It's defensible if members of the public submit FOIs about it. And I'd be happy to discuss this with anybody and be comfortable about defending it. So that just illustrates the, the, the benefit of doing a bit of research to find out some basic info to um, justify a licensed licensing approach. So that's red squirrels. I'll move on quickly to talk about raptors uh, because they're one of the other main constraints. And there's a white-tailed eagle in Norway that I stole off of Twitter last night. I must contact that lady and thank her. So we all know that uh, I guess that we've got Forestry Commission Guidance Note 32 and RSPB helped to write this and um, there are exclusion zones that we are all probably pretty familiar with and we have to enact scores if not hundreds of these exclusion zones every year which uh, during the breeding season which significantly disrupts operations and that's fine but um, we're getting more and more raptors as the population grows, so there's more and more constraints. And as I said earlier, hardly a single operation uh, job on FLS land uh, comes up that doesn't have a constraint of some sort or the others. And raptors and other birds are one of the main constraints. So we need to look at ways of trying to alleviate uh, these pressures. The first thing is that these exclusion zones are just estimates. So that came as a bit of a surprise to me when I first found that out many years ago. Um, so they're, they're guesses based on experience rather than empirical studies. And I guess because they were written by the RSPB largely, some of them are quite conservative and quite excessive, some people have said. One interesting thing is that when we contacted all the other state forestry organisations around the world and got there, uh, they've essentially got the same note that they've they've come up with unilaterally and their exclusion zones are remarkably similar. So it looks like humans across the world think similarly about the sensitivities uh, of birds. But anyway, the key thing here is that those distances are, are not science based, they're not empirical based and um, they are open to interpretation. So I'll give you one example where we do, we've done some work to try and reduce some of these um, zones. So white-tailed eagles, you can see one nesting in the um, Sitka here up north in one of our forests in Sutherland. And this species is increasing rapidly and is expected to reach about a thousand pairs and about 50 years time, I think, or less than that, I forget exactly, but the growth rate is quite incredible. And they very frequently nest in trees in plantations. Um, golden eagles uh, nest around the edges of forests, sometimes in forests, but often in cliffs within forests. And the exclusion zones for 
Golden Eagles can be up to 1,500 metres. So that's a significant uh, distance. For white-tailed eagles, which are a more confiding bird, um, they can, the exclusion zone extend, extends to only 500 metres. But both of these distances can be significant if it includes a timber haulage route. So we had situations for a situation for many years whereby haulage was constrained on major timber haulage routes that were sometimes about a mile from a golden eagle nest and that seemed quite excessive uh, to me so along with somebody called pete cosgrove we undertook some basic observational work whilst we got that lorry that you saw a moment ago in this lorry we got that to drive up and down roads at various distances from golden eagle and white-tailed eagle nests and these young ecologists here made lots of observations of the eagles as the lorries passed uh, back and forth and in a nutshell what they found was that there was no significant response at all from golden eagles to vehicles as close as 350 meters and for white-tailed eagles vehicles could pass within as close as 50 meters and the birds weren't really bothered at all they just turned their head and looked they didn't get up they didn't stand up didn't look alarmed in any way whatsoever so uh, these are significantly shorter distances than the ones that we currently have in our guidance so just by this simple observational study this was a, actually a pilot study involving about 12 pairs of eagles so we can do more on this but already we are using this study, which is published um, to reduce constraints with no detriment to the birds whatsoever, um, which is uh, really good news for all concerned. So in summary then, plantations are crucial habitats for many species. And whenever we look at any of these species in detail, um, the collateral damage, i.e., you know, nest sites being destroyed or young occasionally being killed or animals being disturbed this collateral damage as i've termed it to individuals from operations is not a conservation issue it's overall it's pretty trivial with the example red squirrels we found that th these populations are viable in landscapes managed for timber without any special management whatsoever so that has led to us using this uh, license which gives a much more pragmatic and open way of managing squirrels, explicitly acknowledging that there may be some harm, but it's trivial and we can demonstrate that. So it's given us a lot more latitude to work with this species, uh, is alleviating constraints on operations and saving us a fair amount of money. And I guess my final point is that if we want to improve mitigation similarly for other species, species other than eagles and squirrels, we need to do a bit more work. OK, thank you very much. OK, thanks, Kenny. Um, uh, another uh, excellent presentation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, again, not much in the chat, uh, but if I can um, use the chair's prerogative and just ask you to so, touched on both um, the research aspect to it, but also the observational aspect to it. And I'm just wondering whether or not you feel that there is actually a, um, a role for um, anecdotal and observational um, uh, input into licensing. Uh, because again, you, you did say, you know, a lot of us knew what uh, in their guts what the situation was with squirrels. Do you see that as being accepted in uh, the licensing um, uh, field? I th it's a good question, Will, and I think the answer could be yes, but it would have to be done in a sort of organised way. So in FLS, I got a number of our environment staff for a, a couple of years to record examples where they'd developed site-specific mitigation for, you know, a raptor nest or something, where they hadn't stuck exactly to the, the exclusion zone, but they'd amended it uh, taken into account topography and screening, etc. I got them to record each case history and the outcome. So I got to about 50 of those and virtually all of them had a favourable outcome where we'd 
we'd push the mitigation a wee bit. So I haven't quite got round to uh, writing that, that up yet, but I was intending to do that and publish it in Scottish Forestry. It'd be quite useful. So for any particular issue, we could do the same. We could ask a group of people, perhaps some of the people at this meeting, to make recording, uh, to record certain pieces of info about what they did and what the outcome was for the, the species, for example, and we could collate those and present that in making a case to Nature Scott. And I have to say the licensing department, Nature Scott, is really quite helpful and open minded. So I think there would be a minimal to that, yes. Yeah, that's great. Um I've got a hand raised from Hugh Clayton. Right. Thank you very much, Kenny. Fascinating as ever. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes. there's, a, there's a looming issue, Kenny, that would be good to get some pragmatic input. And I know Nature Scott and uh, Scottish Forestry are already working on this, but I'm, I'm referring here to the um, ash dieback. And I've been taking a fairly close interest in this, as you can imagine, from a tree health point of view. But I know that Alan Gale's work on the um, uh, your your estate, six thousand odd trees in the sample, and half of those were already in the uh, higher bracket of disease, so less than fifty percent canopy. And clearly, this is a tree species that's got bats associated with it. Quick observations locally on mature trees. I couldn't spot a single mature tree within about a mile of where I live that you couldn't hand on heart think bats might be present. And a very quick fag packet of the sort of, of scale of things coming our way with 11 million ash trees, mature ash trees, about 60% forecast to die in the next 20 years. And if you th just take 5 to 10% of those being in an area of danger and requiring potentially work done to fell or limb, that's 15 to 30,000 trees a year. And yet bats have this very strict and you know, rightly so legislation applied to them. Can you maybe give us some thoughts on how that might be handled as a looming issue? Well, the first thing to say is that there is a licensing facility to do things that might otherwise break the law in relation to bats. So technically it's possible to, to, to fail trees that may have bats in them, but um, you know, we routinely work with bats. There are steps you can take, observations you can make, decisions you can, you can, you know, quantify the likelihood of bats being present or not. You could also put that number of trees, although it sounds massive, you could maybe think about putting that in the context of um, of all the available uh, habitat there are for bats to roost in in a given area. You can make some calculations, for example on the amount of dead wood that's in a landscape based on uh, dead wood accumulation rates that forest research have recently come up with. You know, put it in context and uh, make a case for the licensed felling of these trees. It, 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 obviously, there's a health and safety issue, and I think fundamentally that that trumps uh, concerns about bats, you know, to be hard nosed about it. So, but you still have to make the case for taking the action that you've described. And as I said, I found SNH generally to be pretty pragmatic, but this is quite a large scale thing you're talking about. So, um, getting the local context and what it means for bats would be the first step that I would undertake, I guess. That's helpful. Thanks, Kenny. Yeah, um, a couple of other points um, here that people are making, uh, which you can see in the chat. Uh, Dennis Torley is saying many ornithologists are regularly observing yields and operations as planning it and planning FGS contract conditions. Could these be collated by Nature Scott? Um, I mean, I think there is probably something in that as well, that um, there's a lot of licensing returns going into Nature Scott uh, that it could be picked upon and developed. But the difficulty with that, I think, of course, so I agree with you that Nature Scott's licensing team are generally speaking very pragmatic, but also very much under resourced. Uh, I think that has a part to play in it as well. Um, there's another couple of um, questions came in. If I can bring Ian back in, there was one from Douglas Murray about if there was any indication of lidar covering to the north, lidar cover covering lidar cover coming to the north of Scotland anytime soon. Not a question I can answer, I'm afraid. <clears throat> um, it was it was down to Scottish government 
they got the the South Scotland stuff in just before COVID happened. Um, I wasn't aware of anything going on in the north, and I can't imagine anything much has happened. But uh, it's something that you would have to take up with the Scottish government. And uh, the other point was just to clarify. I think you did actually mention it, but the um, uh, the menstruation software you spoke about. Uh, the question was asked, um, is that available um, for others to purchase uh, or is it, was it licensed just to yourselves? I believe Mindbox would be interesting in sell, interested in selling that to anyone that was interested. Okay. Um, and the final point for you that I've got here in the chat, if it was from Helen, was was the difference between surface and terrain LIDAR used to group the tree size on the site? Um, that's not something I know much about, but I know that kind of information is being gathered by people using drones and small LiDAR cameras to try and assess crop height. Um, but I'm afraid it's, it's something I have no experience of myself. And a final one here for uh, you, Ian, from Amy Taylor. Um, what resolution of digital terrain models required to generate the water models? The South Scotland imagery is to 25 centimetres, so it's four points per square metre, and that's more than sufficient. Um, the phase one and two, I think, were two points to the square metre, and that also was sufficient. Um, <laughs> and Pierce has just come in and said, Kenny, nice photo, but you might not want to be screen sharing. <laughs> um, on the on that point, unless there are any other questions, um, I would just like to, to thank at this stage uh, both of our speakers. Uh, two very, very interesting presentations. A lot to take away from there, a lot to think about. Um, both uh, very much up and coming um, issues. Uh, and it's nice to see that level of work being done on both of them. And I'm sure we can all learn from that uh, and, and take it forward. Um, can I perhaps ask uh, Andy Leach uh, now, if he wants to come in um, on the industry uh, leadership group um, and the work he's doing there, please. Evening, folks, and uh, thanks for attending uh, this evening. It looks to be another uh, cracking programme. Anyway, I'm not going to go through my slides. Uh, we forwarded the slides to you with some updates. I just wanted to say a few words on the industry leadership group and ministerial engagement. We'll have the first ILG meeting on the 27th of October since Fergus Hume has moved on. So this will be Mary McAllen's first meeting as co-chair of the ILG. And so we'll be taking that opportunity to focus and just emphasise to her about the contribution that the sector can make to Scotland's economy and climate change mitigation. But I have to say, um, Stuart Goodall and I have met with her on separate occasions and uh, she was very clear and very enthusiastic about the, the good work the sector has already done and uh, it still gives her full support. So that, that's very positive and we'll see if that comes through at the ILG. Uh, Guy Watt and I have also uh, been talking to Aidan McKee, who is Minister for Trade, Business, Tourism and Enterprise, I think it is. But his focus is on um, bringing together a, a new economic strategy for our Scottish Government. And uh, we've been talking to him very specifically about what our sector can do uh, to, to contribute positively. And also in this kind of post-COVID Brexit or whatever has caused this, this impact on the supply chains, this has really uh, brought Scottish Government alive and looking at potentially the the shortages in the construction industry and they're looking at how can we shorten supply chains and certainly homegrown timber has become quite a, a high profile and quite a focus area so there's quite a lot of activity in, in Scottish Government uh, looking at how can we bring more uh, homegrown material into to construction so it was really just to touch base off with you on that but um, hopefully you'll find the rest of the information the slides of interest but that's all it was Will. Okay, that's great, Andy. Thanks very much for that. Um, and uh, if I can ask Jamie just to come in as well um, and uh, do the uh, the industry update, that'd be great. Thanks, Jamie. 
thanks, Will. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through the uh, the, the uh, everything that um, I uh, uh, sent through in in my presentation, um, but I did want to just highlight a, a couple of important points, if I may. Um, are you uh, are you seeing that OK? Uh, yeah, but it's not full presentation of you yet, Jimmy. Come on. Just a couple of things. So um, just to uh, in case it slipped your uh, uh, slip your notice, um, Scottish Forest, you have just uh, issued a new briefing note as a warning that they uh, are under pressure from a, uh, an old EU audit uh, to check on stocking densities uh, of, uh, and that I you achieved a proper two and a half thousand stems per hectare at year five, and they will be writing to uh, a selection of agents asking them to carry out surveys. Uh, so that's uh, just make sure you understand that and. Uh, have a look, see uh, if your three and four year old crops are, are performing the way that uh, you would want them to. Um, hot off the press is uh, a little warning that's come through the nurseries that uh, they are probably facing quite a shortage of acorns this, this year. Uh, I have um, uh, sent a message to Doug Hosen asking how they will treat that if um, there's insufficient stock to complete any specific scheme, and we will let you know what's uh, what, what's happening there in our e-news updates. Uh, I expect you all realise, most of you will realise, there have been several important changes at uh, Scottish Forestry. Jim Dewar, uh, who is well known in the the, the north of Scotland, has uh, is retiring at the end of this month. And James Knott has taken over as uh, head of Tree Health. And uh, therefore, we are looking forward to the appointment of a new conservator. Um, uh, and uh, that, that, that is not public knowledge as yet. And down in the south, Neil Murray, um, who used to be uh, with uh, Forestry and Land Scotland, has taken over as conservator there. In terms of new woodland creation, uh, particularly important this one, these figures are what was presented to the customer reps group uh, at the end of August. We have not completed um, claims yet for at that moment over 850 hectares not claimed. And um, at the same time, there were uh, because of the weather conditions, um, you know, we uh, although there were 13,500 hectares uh, approved for a 2020 claim year, uh, because of weather and all the rest of it, uh, we only managed to complete about 10,500 hectares. And there are still some, one th well, there were at the end of August, still 1,000 hectares of potential rollover into a 2021 claim year which had not been sorted out. Now, I know that many of you have been working with uh, Scottish forestry uh, staff trying to deal with this, but please let's get on and, and finish that that claim year off. It's it's holding up uh, a number of different things and uh, taking up unnecessary work time for both yourselves and, and for the Conservancy staffs. Uh, Jamie, and just to uh, let you know that you, Jamie, just to let you know your presentation isn't actually moving on. Oh, rats! Where are where are you at? Um, we're still on your first page, and we're still seeing your present your non presentation view. Oh, um, right. Uh, uh, I will. Um, uh, I'll I'll give up uh, presenting. I just um, you've just now moved it onto new world and creation Hector Hector slide. <laughs> uh, new woodland creation. We've we've lost your presentation altogether, Jamie. Okay, uh, don't don't worry. Just 
just to point out that in the slide that uh, gave the figures for new woodland creation, um, to highlight again, those were at the end of August, uh, um, told the uh, approvals for a 2021 year claim are now over 12,000. So, and with uh, a, a significant number of schemes still submitted, but not yet approved, we are online to, to meet the target of private sector approvals of um, 13,000 hectares this year um, with about 500 hectares being done on the National Forest Estate. And the pipeline is still uh, quite healthy. So uh, keep the good work up everybody and keep the schemes rolling in. Uh, thank you, Well, that's really all I, I need to say. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Jamie. Again, um, uh, the, the slides that Jamie were referring to were in the presentation that were sent to you through the uh, the joining email. Um, so everything that he's got there is all summarised in his, his uh, presentation. Um, we've done rather well tonight, I think. Uh, unless there are any further questions, we're going to finish slightly ahead of um, uh, time, which is almost unheard of from my chairmanship. So um, thank you for all, all for that. Uh, but I'd just like to reiterate um, uh, the, our thanks on behalf of you all to the two speakers tonight um, for two excellent presentations uh, with lots of good, interesting information in them. Always a pleasure to uh, to see these um, uh, these talks at these events. And thank you also to everyone involved in the organisation of this, uh, Jamie in particular, uh, but also I think Fiona in the background for uh, manfully dealing with the admissions into the uh, uh, the, the meeting. Um, and of course, uh, for our funders, uh, and not last uh, to all of you uh, for uh, joining us and supporting um, uh, the industry meetings uh, in this format. As I said before, um, I would really like uh, that the next one be in person so we can get back to some networking, as it was said I think, by peers at the beginning, uh, that uh, there wasn't an awful lot of chatter going on at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, that's something I think we all miss uh, in the uh, the the face-to-face -face meetings uh, is the networking aspect. So um, from all of us, I think, unless Jamie has any last words, thank you all um, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you.